For a moment, we're going to discuss the relationships between topology and differential geometry, which is what we're doing in analysis when we discuss vector fields, and we've mentioned the index already. So a lot of these ideas um, are closely related to the fact that there is an intricate relationship between these different fields in mathematics. And what we're going to discuss as a preliminary is some important ideas in topology that allow us to relate the topology and homotopy theory that we've been discussing so far and the analysis of vector fields and critical points and indices. So for that, we need to make sense of triangulations and also of simplicial complexes. So rather than giving the um, precise definition, which is in the notes, I want to give you an idea of what a simplicial complex is. So a simplicial complex is more or less a set, but it's created out of zero-dimensional simplices. And by the way, we all know what a simplex is because we described it much, much earlier when we talked about convex subsets. So remember the notation for this was delta zero. And we have a collection of one simplices. So we just have a, a, a large union of all of these things, um, and so on, of different dimensions as well. And these are filled in. These are two simplices. three-dimensional ones as well, and so on. The idea is that uh, a simplicial complex is a collection of these, and let's say for, for the purposes of everything that we do, we're going to work with finite um, simplicial complexes, though it makes sense to have an infinite number of these as well. Um, and they satisfy the condition that if you look at the boundary of all of these, or the different faces, they're all simplices of lower dimensional things. So for instance, when I try to pu put together some of these simplices, like a couple of triangles in this manner, uh, maybe I can stick out some uh, one-dimensional simplices here. Maybe I can even attach um, a tetrahedron at this point. And these are all filled in, by the way. Uh, one of the important things is that every single face, and by face I sort of mean in a, in a generalized sense, that if I have a three-dimensional thing, the faces are all two-dimensional, and the faces of the two-dimensional things are one-dimensional edges, and the faces of one-dimensional edges are the vertices. So it's essentially a collection of vertices, edges, faces, and higher dimensional objects, which are given by simplices, glued in a specific way so that the faces are always lower dimensional simplices. And uh, it's best to understand this rather than in a formal definition uh, in a couple of examples. And by the way, we, did, we denote the set of all zero simplices as k0, the set of one simplices as k1, two simplices as k2, and the general simplicial complex as a set K consisting of simplices. And the dimension of the simplicial complex is the level at which afterwards no higher simplices are included. So it's the highest simplex available and nothing higher than that. So let's look at the example, the boundary of a simplex. Let's take M. So the boundary of a simplex, we can look at these examples that we have here, the boundary of a zero simplex is nothing. There is no boundary. The boundary of a one simplex are the two endpoints, which is a simplex because it's a union of zero dimensional simplices. The boundary of a two simplex is a set of three edges and three vertices, which is also a simplex. The boundary of a tetrahedron, for example, is the set of the 
four different faces of this tetrahedron, the six different edges that you see here and one in the back, and then four vertices. And the union of that forms a simplex again. So it's pretty clear that the boundary of a simplex is a simplicial complex. But you might wonder, how do I know how many simplices there are of each dimension? And this is essentially a counting problem. And if you look at what we were studying before, the counting problem is exactly related to Pascal's triangle. So let's take, for instance, the one simplex. The one simplex, the number of vertices is 2. So we're actually at this level for the boundary of a one simplex. And you can think of the number of faces as starting here, and the number of edges, um, or rather, sorry, faces here, and then um, the, na the, the last piece is not included because it's empty. So for instance, if we go to a two simplex, that should be here, and the number of vertices in a two simplex is three. Oh, I should start with the, um, the faces here. So the number of faces is 1, the number of edges is 3, and the number of vertices is also 3. So we should think of these as highest dimension. And then we go lower in this direction. So for a 3 simplex, again, these are the numbers of the, the interior. And then the, um, the faces are 4 six and vertices are four. But if we take the boundary, then we're actually not looking at this rightmost side. So we're only looking at what comes afterwards because we're not including that largest dimension. So the number of k simplices, sorry, the number of i simplices, so remember this notation denotes the cardinality of a set um, where k is the boundary of, let's say, the m simplex is just given by a combinatorial factor, which is just m plus 1 choose i plus 1. So this is just a, an illustrative example. Um, there are lots of other interesting examples um, that I'll leave you to think about and that are also in the notes. Um, sorry, rather than example, this is more of a definition. A triangulation of a manifold, let's say M, is a simplicial complex, or consists of a simplicial complex, K, together with a homeomorphism from K to M. And this homeomorphism, by the way, homeomorphism means there's a continuous map from K to M because both of these are, um, well, topological spaces. They have open sets. I can make sense of what that means. And I know manifolds are subsets of Euclidean space, so I know what that means. And these are home, and I demand that there's a homeomorphism from that simplicial complex to M. And what this definition is more or less saying is that um, if I have a manifold, a triangulation of that manifold is sort of like an approximation by using triangles of certain different dimensions. And we have to actually use triangles of all dimensions up to the dimension of that manifold. And the reason we need lower dimensions is so that we can keep the faces as well. So what's an example? Um, actually, we already have an example up here a triangulation of the M-sphere is given by looking at the boundary of a simplex. And if you notice, the boundary of a one simplex is just two points. And that those two points is exactly the sphere of, rate of dimension 0 because the set of points in R satisfying x squared equals 1 is x equals plus and minus 1. So those are the two points, and that defines the zero sphere. 
In the case of a two simplex, its boundary is a triangle without the interior included, and that looks like a circle. It's not exactly a circle, but it's homeomorphic to one. I can find a continuous bijection with continuous inverse to the circle. And the idea is just look at the center and then take each point on the boundary and because it's away from the center you can push it out or push it in depending on how large this is so that it has unit length. And then that gives you a map to the sphere and then you could go backwards. And that's actually the idea for all different simplices. If I take the center of a tetrahedron and then I take a sphere, I can just push the tetrahedron and then extend out all of the boundary points to the sphere and I can also go back. And notice I'm not saying that these maps are smooth or differentiable in any sense, they're certainly not. This isn't even a smooth manifold. So really a triangulation is sort of a way of extracting some topological information of a particular manifold. And when we have a triangulation and a simplicial complex, we can actually define something called the Euler characteristic of that simplicial complex and of that manifold. And the Euler characteristic of a simplicial complex K is given by a specific integer, and we denote that integer with so chi of k, and it's the alternating sum of the different vertices, edges, faces, and so on of the different k simplices. It's the sum from i equals 0 to the max dimension of that simplex, whatever that dimension is, so again this only makes sense for finite uh, simplicial complexes multiplied by an alternating factor and all we do is we count the number of i simplices. So we just count the number of i simplices and put an appropriate sign depending on what uh, parity it is. And if m is a manifold We choose a triangulation K, which is also equipped with a homeomorphism, and then we define chi M to be chi of K. And you should immediately ask, what if I chose a different triangulation? Would I get the same number? That better be true because otherwise this doesn't even make sense and it's not a well-defined quantity because I've chosen a triangulation to define it. It's a fact that the Euler characteristic of a simplicial complex is independent up to homeomorphism, which means if I have another homeomorphism to a different simplicial complex, then the two Euler characteristics are in fact the same. And that allows me to make this definition um, for the Euler characteristic of a manifold. So let's look at an example. Uh, for example, we can look at these different spheres of different dimensions. The sphere is given by, um, has a triangulation given by the boundary of a specific simplex, and we know exactly how many simplices there are in each dimension for that simplex, for that simplicial complex. So for S1, for example, we know that S1 is the boundary of the two simplex, and it has three vertices and three edges. So vertices come equipped with a positive sign, so it's three, and edges have a minus sign. So three minus three, we get Euler characteristic zero for S1. If we look at S2, that's the boundary of the tetrahedron, and that has three vertices, sorry, four vertices, six edges, and how many faces? Four. So what do we get? The Euler characteristic of S2 is two. And in fact, you can calculate the Euler characteristic of a sphere of any dimension using this formula, and you're gonna get only two possible values. 
either you'll get 0 or 2. And I'll let you think about when that happens. It depends on what m is.